Thank you, Lord. We've been studying in the book of Ezra and Nehemiah. Mm -hmm. And it's a time when the exiles from Judea are returning, specifically to Jerusalem, to rebuild their city. The rebuilding isn't so much on the business as not so much even though Nehemiah focuses on it, on the walls. But if you pay close attention, even Nehemiah's walls were so that they could freely worship. Praise God. And so their going back to rebuild was in conjunction with God's original plan. God wanted something rebuilt, and they were going back to rebuild it. And so we land on the title for my message today, A Life Worth Rebuilding. A Life Worth Rebuilding. We're going to pick up today beginning in 2 Chronicles 36, the very end of Chronicles and then we're going to walk through Ezra and Nehemiah. And I had purpose to do a comparison of Nehemiah and Ezra. But for time's sake and because of the direction of the Holy Spirit, I had to go in another direction. Maybe we'll pick that up another time. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. But for today, our focus is a life worth rebuilding. Mm -hmm. Life, someone said, is God's gift to you. And what you do with it is your gift to God. After this lockdown, many people are going to want to get back to life as normal. They're going to want to go back and rebuild whatever it was that they were building before the pandemic. But you got to ask yourself, and it's healthy to assess yourself and ask this question on a regular basis. Are the things that I'm building worth being built? Are the things that I'm building in my life, are they really worth being built? Are the things that you're so in a hurry to get back to, are they worth rebuilding? God himself is in the rebuilding business. But I want you to know that God does not rebuild everything. Everything isn't worth rebuilding. The Tower of Babel wasn't worth rebuilding. Sodom and Gomorrah wasn't worth rebuilding. Even the walls of Jericho were not supposed to be rebuilt. Do you hear me? There are things in life that present themselves as distractions from what we really ought to be doing. They present themselves as distractions to take our focus from the main thing and put it on something else. Everything isn't worth rebuilding. Some relationships ain't worth rebuilding. Do y'all hear me? Some relationships ain't worth rebuilding. Some of the things that we involve ourselves ain't worth running back to. Some of the consumerism that we were so heavily involved in ain't worth engaging our time and spending our hard-earned money on. Some of the television shows that we spend hours watching ain't worth being in a hurry to get back to. A lot of the activities that people can't wait Clubbing and running from here and there and doing all sorts of things isn't worth rebuilding. Mm -hmm. Do y'all hear me? Mm -hmm. The false hopes that this world gives so many people aren't worth reinvesting in. Everything isn't worth rebuilding. Hallelujah. But some things are worth rebuilding and some kind of way... The enemy, the world, and our flesh, some kind of way, make sure that those are the very things that are neglected. Wow. Amen. 
God himself has been on a mission ever since Genesis chapter 3 to get us back to rebuild Eden living. Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2 gives us God's perfect plan. Or should I say his original intent? You know, when you want to know what somebody wants, you got to get back to their original intent. Sometimes when we're talking about the Constitution, you see uh, pundits and you see political figures talk about the founding father's original intent. When you pass a law from Congress uh, and the regulators have to go and enforce that law, oftentimes they want to know what the spirit of the law is or what the original intent was. Because sometimes in life and sometimes in law and sometimes in the course of just going about our daily life, we get caught up in the details and forget the original intent. And we find ourselves building but not building a life worth rebuilding. Mm -hmm. If we had to do all over again, at the end of some people's lives, they'll say there's many things, not just a few things, but many things they'll do different. Is there anything you would do different if you had the chance to do it again? Well, God is giving you this opportunity as a reset. Before you come off a lot down, before you go back to what you call normal, you're given the opportunity to assess whether or not everything is worth rebuilding. That's right. Is that right? Yes. God is on a mission. God himself has a will and a plan, and he is working it out yeah. in the earth today. And those who are in the know are working with God. And those who aren't are not. God says, I know the thoughts that I think towards you, said the Lord. I know the plans that I have for you. And they're good. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. God is working. And in his mission, he recruits and enlists individuals to work with him. Amen. What is he working to do? To rebuild Eden. To reestablish Eden living. To take us in Revelation. If you read the back of the book. Some people like to buy a book. They skip right to the back. To find out what's going to happen. You start reading a book and you're in suspense. And you want to know what happened. Maybe, maybe today people fast forward to the end of the show. To see what happens right. You get so anxious. I've had one of my children tell me that one time. They got anxious, so they went on to the end. You know, they couldn't wait. Or maybe we were supposed to watch a movie or a TV show together, and they just couldn't wait for everybody. They just had to watch it by themselves because they, they got so good to them. Am I telling the truth? They got, they got so good to them that they just had to find out. And so when you're reading the Bible or when you're living for God, some people get so excited about Revelation. One, because it's the end of things and lots of cool and crazy things happen. But two, because it tells you how the story ends. It tells you what happens. Well, spoiler alert, we win. By the blood of the Lamb Amen. and the word of our testimony. Amen. We win. That's the end of the story. But now between now and then, God is working to get to an expected end. But we already know what the end looks like. Because the end looks like the beginning. In the beginning, there was rivers flowing into a place that provided for it. In the beginning, there was fruit and everything in abundance all around. In the beginning, there was, there was no sickness and no disease and, and no sin. In the beginning, all that was in Eden. And in the end, the same thing shows up again. Rivers flowing into the, or flowing out of the city of God. And you see trees that are good for the healing of the nations. And you got people who are walking around and there's no more crying, there's no more sickness, there's no more disease, and no more memory of the former things. And it's just like it was. And over the span of all of his story, God has been working to get us back. Do you understand? Amen. And when you get saved, mm -hmm. God doesn't always promise you a better life here. When you compare your life 
For most of us, our lives get better because God gives us wisdom. And the sins that held us down and the consequences thereof that affected our life in negative ways are no longer holding us back. And so when we get saved, we start to experience a prosperity and an abundance in life that we didn't know before. But that's not the gospel. As a matter of fact, as part of the gospel, some things in your life may not look as good as they did. You may lose some friends behind living for Jesus. Hmm? You may lose some of the activities that you enjoy if you really want to live for Jesus. You may have to change your identity if you really want to live for Jesus. You may have to give up some of the things that, that you identify with, that you stood on, that, that, that made you who you were. You might have to say goodbye in order to go with God in his mission of getting us back to Eden living. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9, we are laborers together with God. Those who are Christians, he's writing to some Christians now. And he's speaking about himself and the other apostles that they are laborers together with God. Are you a laborer with God? Have you worked for the things of God to be accomplished in the earth? Is that what your life is based on? Have you, have you structured your life in such a way that God's going to get some glory mm. out of what you do? Mm. Out of how you act? Out of how you treat people? Out of how you spend your time and money. Is God going to get the glory? He recruits and he enlists laborers. People who are going to actually do something. Who's going to put their hand to the plow and not turn back. Yes. But what the devil does is anything he can do. In order to keep you from doing that. He comes with a false narrative. Yes. Do you know what a false narrative is? A false narrative is a, is a political and psychological concept where you come along and you tell somebody something that isn't 100% true so that they are distracted from the truth. Because you don't have to keep people completely away from the truth. You just have to alter it enough until they ain't on track. If you got a plane that's headed from New York to D.C., it only has to turn a couple of degrees to be off, to miss its mark. And so it is in your life, the devil don't have to do a whole lot to get you off track. That's true. All he got to do is distract you a little Amen. bit. All he got to do is present a false narrative to, to you and tell you that something in your life isn't the way that God said it was. All he has to do is tell you that something in your life isn't quite the way that God, has God really said. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, now you know God's been holding back on you because God knows that when you do that, you're going to experience a pleasure and a joy that he's been holding back on you. See, the, 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 the schemes, the wiles of the devil have not changed. And so he presents a false narrative to get us distracted and to lull us into furious pursuits so that we spend our time on stuff that don't count. Wow. Let me say that again. Wow. So that you spend your time on stuff that don't count. So that you spend your good hard-earned money on stuff that don't matter. So that you spend the most precious thing you got your mind time thinking about past offenses. Thinking about how somebody did you wrong and what other people think about you. He take up real estate in your mind and, and, and get some mind time and get you thinking about stuff that don't do you no good. I'm not easily offended, but I've learned when I am offended to hurry up and get over it. Because the offense holds me back. It puts a fence around me. Yes. 
Not around the person that offended me. Yeah. They go on with life. They go on with, with whatever they was doing before they offended me and might be glad that they did. Mm. Might be glad that now I'm caught chasing my tail mm. and might watch me sit there on standstill and be happy. You know, when they were rebuilding the temple, there were some people in the land that didn't want them to rebuild. That's true. That's true. That's true. And they did everything they could to distract them and deter them and to get them to stop. Yes. They said, even come and, 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 and meet with us. Come on down off the wall, Nehemiah. Mm -hmm. Nehemiah understood that was a distraction. Mm -hmm. He said, no, the work I do is too great. See, if you don't have a great work in your life, mm -hmm. your life will lack significance. Do you hear me? And one of the greatest needs you have, if not the greatest, isn't food, water, shelter. It's significance. Because if you got significance, you can pass. Woo, good God. If you got significance, you can go without for a while because you're trying to get somewhere. If you got significance, you will make certain sacrifices of things that people think you need, but you know you can do without because you got something greater that you're sacrificing for. Do you hear me? Lord, have mercy. Thank yes. you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Ghost. And so God invites us and enlists us to participate in his dream. And let me tell you something. The American dream is not God's dream. God's dream is so much better. I'm going to say that again. God's dream for you is better than the American dream. Because what the American dream offers you is temporary. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What the American dream offers you is materialistic only. Yes. What the American dream offers you comes with a price that might be too heavy to pay. That's right. But what God offers. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The Bible says he make the rich and add no song. No song. Yes. Good God Almighty. <laughs> what God offers. The Bible says what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul. What God offers. When he comes in, he brings everything with him that comes with him. Everything yes. God has comes when he shows up. And what he offers you is himself. Good God Almighty. And in, in exchange for your attention being on all those frivolous things, he invites you to come with him, be with him, and work beside him. That's right. In rebuilding a life worth rebuilding. It all begins with a call. Number one. Everything God does begins with a call. Before he, did, before he established the nation of Israel, he called a man named Abraham. Come on. Before he delivered them out of Egyptian bondage, he called a man named Moses. Yes. Everything God does begins with a call because God don't like to work alone. Mm -hmm. Not that he can't work alone because in the beginning he was working all by himself. Yes, right. He created the heavens, the earth, and everything that was in it all by himself. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. And he ain't, need no, he ain't need no help. But see, God is a family man. Mm. God is the kind of God that wants to incorporate others in the work that he's doing. And in so doing, he gives us significance. Mm. In so doing, he gives us meaning and purpose in life. And without it, you don't have it. Mm. Some people are suicidal because they, they miss significance. Mm. Some people are high on medications because they lack meaning. Some people are pursuing frivolous things because they lack purpose. Do you hear me? Mm. When you find yourself pursuing, pursuing something frivolous, ask yourself, what's the purpose? Do I have a greater purpose? There's nothing wrong with leisure and recreation. As a matter of fact, God recommends it. The Sabbath is about rest, reflection. Huh? Recuperation and even recreation. 
There's a, there's a such thing as holy recreation. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. But you got to ask yourself, what's the purpose? See, God has a purpose. And so whenever he wants to include you in the purpose, he begins by drawing you into it with a call. He draws you into his purpose, into what he's doing with a call, a sense of responsiveness, a sense of responsibility, a sense of this needs to happen. You may be perfectly fine with where you are, but God will call you to something completely different. He might call you to a lifestyle to give up something, to a lifestyle that's far beneath what you used to. When Nehemiah left for Jerusalem, he left a very high position back in Persia. He left all the comforts that went with that and the development that was there. They had the sewer system going. They had the electricity going. Everything was nice in Persia. When he went back to Jerusalem, the walls weren't even built. But he sensed a call. Good God. He sensed a call. He sensed a, a urging. He sensed what we call in the old church an unction mm. of the Holy Ghost. Everything God does begins with a call. Amen. God initiates. God even initiated your salvation. You didn't decide to get saved all by yourself. The Holy Ghost was drawing you. How do I know? Because Jesus revealed to us that no man comes to the Father unless the Holy Ghost draws. Hallelujah. And so you've got to understand call or you won't know how to respond right when God does it. Amen. Do you hear me? Amen. You've got to understand when God is calling you. In various places in the Old Testament, and even in the old church, we used to call it the burden of the Lord. Amen. God will put something on you, and you will be so disturbed by it. Yes. Wow. Huh? There's lots of problems in the world, but you'll see one particular problem, yes. and it will really move you. Yes. yes. You will be you will be drawn to solve some situation that may not even have nothing to do with you, but you are drawn to solve it. Amen. Mm. It really worked you in your spirit. Spirit, you really feel the need. Sometimes if, if you're really sensitive, it'll bring you to tears. Amen. Wow. And not just because it's sad, because there's problems all around, but you got to know which problems are yours to solve. Right. right. And you don't just know it, you feel it. Mm. I know that I know that we try to teach people not to follow feelings, right? Mm. But now God made you a feeling creature. Huh? And I know and I teach that your feelings ought to follow your thoughts. And most of the time they do. And so if you get your thoughts right, you can get your feelings right because you can't trust your emotions. But God will touch you to feel something way yes. down deep past your emotions. Yes. Good God. Yes. I said you'll feel it past your emotions. Yes. You yes. will sense it, so to speak, in yes. the spirit. Yes. Yes. You will sense it as a light on the inside. The spirit of man is a candle that the Lord uses to guide him. Mm. And so God will stir you in your spirit Amen. to call you to the work he's doing in the earth. Mm. Starting in 2 Chronicles, the very end of the fall of Jerusalem. There is at the very last part. Let's look at chapter 36. 2 Corinthians chapter 36, verse 23. And I'm going to read from the King James Version because it's easier to identify there. And I will primarily be coming from the King James Version. 2 Corinthians 36, 23. Thus said Cyrus, king of Persia. All the kingdoms of the earth hath the Lord God of heaven given me, and he hath charged me to build him a house in Jerusalem. Amen. 
which is in Judah. Who is there among you of all his people? The Lord his God be with him and let him go up. Y'all see that? That word, I wish I had time to preach it, go up. It's Allah. Not the Allah of the Islamic faith, but Allah, A-L-A-H. Allah means to go up. Hallelujah. Go up. Hallelujah. Thank you. Well, you, ever, you ever been depressed? When you're depressed, the devil's sitting on your head, sitting on your emotions, sitting on your mind, and pushing you down. But God says, go up. Your life ought to be an upward trajectory. Your life ought to be up and to the right. Your life ought to be a series of always abounding in the word of the Lord. Yes. You ought to look back over your life and see nothing but progress. Yeah, there might be a few dips here and there, but overall, you can draw a line and connect the dots to progress. That's the way God expects every Christian to live. A life that goes up. And so God used the secular government to issue a decree to do what he wanted. Did you hear me? I said God used the secular government to get done what he wanted. Good God. God did it. Do you hear me? Now, 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 now. they may not have known it was God. Because Cyrus issued this same decree to other peoples. That was his policy. But you see, even the policy makers, their hearts are in the hands of the Lord. Amen. Amen. And God will use folk even when they don't even know they're being used of God. God will use folk who ain't even willing to be used, but he'll use them anyway to get done what he's trying to do. Now, they won't get no reward for it if they're not willing. But he'll use them anyhow. Matter of fact, he will use your enemies to be your blessing. Yes. He will use your enemies. Psalm 23 says he will make your enemies a footstool. Amen. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. He'll prepare a table before you in the presence of them. And you'll, you'll step on your enemies to get to the next level. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, yes. Do you hear me? Mm -hmm. And so God, through Cyrus, has opened the door. To some new possibilities. Mm. Whenever there's a call, there's an open door. Mm -hmm. There's an opportunity. Do you hear me? Mm. There's an opportunity that goes along with the call. Mm. There's an opportunity that goes along with the call. If you have a call and have no opportunity, then, then hold tight because God is about to make one. Now if you turn the page. That was Chronicles. Turn to Ezra chapter 1, the very next page in the way your, your English Bible is laid out. And in verse 2 and 3, you'll see the same decree, thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, the king, I'm sorry, the Lord God of heaven, have given me all the kingdoms of the earth and have charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Mm -hmm. Who is there among you? That's the question. Who is there? Who will go for the Lord? I'm going to say that again. Who's going to go for the Lord? Mm -hmm. Who is there among you of all his people? His God be with him and let him, Allah, let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel. He is God, which is in Jerusalem. You see that? Let him go up. The, the, the call was in the opportunity to go do what God had told them to do. God had already said in the book of Jeremiah chapter 25 and 29 that they would be in captivity for 70 years in Babylon, but after 70 years, he would call them back. He would open the door. They didn't know how, but he would open the door and they would, they would go back and build. He would bring them back into the land. Now, here's the opportunity. Why is it important that he bring them back into the land? Because Jerusalem is where he put his name. Jerusalem is where he put his temple. Jerusalem is the center of worship, and worship takes us back to Eden. Do you hear me? Worship takes us back to Eden. That's why worship should be the center of your life. 
Because it takes you right back to God's original intent. Worship takes you back to God's original. When you worship, you want to clean your house. Mm -hmm. When you worship, you want to do right on your job. Yes, yes. When you worship, you want to treat other people right. right. Why? Because something on the inside of you changes when you worship, yes. and it takes you back to Eden, and you establish God's kingdom in the earth. Yes. Amen. Let them go up. Now, what I want you to understand is when the call went out, everybody didn't go. Yeah. This was God's perfect will. In order that his, his temple might be rebuilt. Is that right? Y'all read this this week, right? Yes. God's temple is going to be rebuilt by this remnant of people who decide to leave their businesses, decide to leave that steady paycheck, Decide to leave the comforts of Persia behind. Amen. They were well established in Persia. Some of them had high position. Daniel had a high position. Nehemiah had a high position. You'll find out that even Ezra, the scribe, the priest, was highly regarded by the king. Yes, they were respected. They were affluent. They had done well. God had blessed them while they were in Babylon. And some of them were unwilling to go back. Now you gotta be careful before you judge them because some of y'all are careful in this Babylon. I said America is a Babylon for some of us. Uh, I said America is a Babylon for some of us. God bless America, but it's a Babylon for some of us. Is that right? Yes. And some of us, if we ain't careful, we'll get so careful, so 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 comfortable in this Babylon. Get so comfortable in this world system. Get so comfortable with the pleasures of this world. That when God issue a call, mm. we won't go back. Mm. We won't go back to Eden. I'm too busy. Mm. I've got this, that, and the other. I can't sacrifice today, Lord. Mm. I can't leave this now. Now, now this, you know this is important. Now, you gave me this. He gave them the businesses. Mm. He gave them the influence. He gave them the high positions, but he also gave them a call. And I'm here to tell you that everybody don't respond appropriately to God's call. Wow. Everybody didn't heed the call. In verse 5, it says, Then rose up some of the chief elders of the fathers and, and Benjamin the priests. And if you keep on reading, you find out that some people stayed behind. I don't have time to go into all of it. But everybody didn't go. That's right. Do you hear me? Everybody didn't go. Everybody, let me explain something to you. You got to be careful with the word of God because whenever the word of God goes forth, you always respond to it. You don't always respond positively, but you always yep. respond. That's true. Even in not responding, you're responding. Mm. I'm going to say that again. Even in not responding, you're responding. Even when you don't say nothing, you're saying a whole lot. Well, I just ain't going to say nothing. That don't keep you from guilt. Well, now, 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 I was just busy. I hadn't got around to it. That don't keep you from being guilty of disobedience. Delayed obedience is simply disobedience. Yes. That's until true. you obey. That's true. As long as you in the delay, you in disobedience. That's right. Until you desire to obey, you are in disobedience. That's right. That's why the Bible says that Abraham, when God told him to go sacrifice Isaac, he had to walk with God long enough that he hurry up and get up early. That's right. In the morning. That's right. So often you'll find in the Bible that when God gives somebody a command early the next morning, mm -hmm. they don't hold out, they don't wait, they get up early and do it because they understand that to delay is to disobey. Mm -hmm. Parents, you know when you tell your child to do something and they act like they don't hear you or they act like they got something else that's pressing or they, they call up in something else and you said, didn't I tell you and that well, I was doing this and you're like, you was doing that and didn't do what I said. You get angry immediately because you intuitively know that their delayed obedience is disobedience. That's right. Am I right? That's true. And everybody didn't go back. Everybody wasn't happy about it. Everybody didn't, didn't have a sense of calling. Mm -hmm. To some people, it was imperative. Oh, yes, we got to go back. We've been waiting 70 years for this. 
But to others, they're like, oh, I'm busy. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. Y'all, y'all go ahead and do it. You see, lots of times people want to just let other people do the work of God mm-hmm. while they stay comfortable. Mm-hmm. But even those who didn't go back, the Bible says that many of them, the king told them, and some of them willingly gave Mm -hmm. to the work of the Lord Mm -hmm. to go. So even if you're home right now, even if you you can't do the things that you want to do, even if you can't go into that mission field, but you got a burden for it, even if you can't do what a particular ministry or a church is doing, even if you can't do what the preacher's doing, you can give. That's right. You can give. You may not be able to go back to Jerusalem right now, but you can give to the work. Mm-hmm. That's right. That's right. You may not be able to establish Eden the way they're establishing Eden, but you can give. Don't you know that giving is a fruit of the Spirit? Yes, Don't you know that giving is a, I'm sorry, not a fruit of the Spirit, but a, a gift of the Spirit. Yeah, right. Forgive me. A gift of the Spirit. Giving is a gift of the Spirit. I can make it a fruit, but it's a gift. It's a gift of the Spirit. It's one of the things that certain people have in abundance. They're called to do. to re- See, the gifts of God represent God's work in the earth. And so some people have the gift to prophesy because God wants to prophesy, but he don't want to do it by himself. So he's standing up a man, standing up a woman, put a gift in them and prophesy through them. You see, God want to help. He, want, he wants to help the preacher. He wants to help the ministry. And so he gives some people the gift of helps. Mm. That's right. Because that's what he wants to do. But he don't want to do it himself. He wants to do it through somebody. Mm. Amen. You see, God wants to comfort people. And so he gives some people the gift of mercy. Mm. So that they can comfort other people. Because he don't want to do it himself. All by himself, he wants to do it through you. That's good. You see, and he gives some people the gift of giving. Hallelujah. Mm. Thank you, Jesus. Mm. And you got to give a giving, bless God. Don't think you don't want it because you do. Mm. Because if you got to give a giving, God always got to give you more than enough. Yes. Even when you give out your need, he said he got to supply that need. Hallelujah. Because you were given. That's what Philippians 419, I believe it is, or maybe 49, y'all might help me out. Uh, my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory. That's what that's all about. He was talking to some givers, y'all. Mm. If you understand who the Philippians were and what they gave to. Whereas the other churches didn't, and that's why he didn't say it to them. Yes, Philippians 419. 419, thank you. God blesses the, the giving, the generous hand. Hallelujah. Why? Because he got to give seed to the sower? Yeah. <laughs> He, he has to give seed to the sower. Right. But some who didn't go, they gave, but everybody didn't respond appropriately. That's why Matthew 22, 14 records Jesus as saying, many are called. There's a whole lot of people that God, he stirred them up. He speaks to their heart. He starts to call them. He starts to draw on them. It's his will that everybody be saved. And when you're saved, you're not just saved to get a ticket to heaven. You're saved to be with God and to serve with him. Because our God is a servant. That's the example that he set forth in the book of John when he washed the disciples' feet. He said, look, I'm a servant. Your Lord, your master is washing your feet. Now I've given you an example that you should follow. Mm. Do you understand? Real pastors are servants. Mm. Amen. Real preachers are servants. Mm. Do you understand? They're servant leaders. Mm. Parents are servants, show enough. Mm. Is that right? Oh, yeah. Everybody who done changed the diaper, no, you a servant. Yes. Hallelujah. Done wiped up some vomit, you a servant. Right. Done picked up behind somebody, you a servant. Yes. Is that right? Done cooked the meal, you a servant. You are serving others, but in so doing, you are mimicking Jesus. But many are called, many are called to fellowship, many are called to salvation, many are called to service, But only if you are chosen, you know what God revealed to me, what makes the difference between somebody who's called and somebody who's chosen? It's all in the response. God qualifies you by how you respond to him. God will qualify. See, that's why a lot of people have callings on their life who ain't doing nothing. Wow. Because they ain't responding. It ain't the calling 
that makes a difference. It's the response. Wow. Oh, God. Thank you, Jesus. I know people more anointed who have a greater calling on their life than I do, but they don't look like they're doing nothing. And I look like I'm, I'm doing leaps and bounds compared to them. And you're not supposed to compare yourself, but I'm just giving you an example. Because I responded to my call. Whatever anointing I've got, I'm trying to, to make full proof of my ministry. Yes. Amen. It may not look like much compared to others, but it's, it's more than not doing anything. Amen. And I want to challenge anybody here or anybody listening that if you have a call in your life and you ain't doing nothing with it, shame on you. Ooh shame on you. Hallelujah. And you're making it hard on everybody else because you ain't doing what you're supposed to do. Shame on you. Praise God. And so we see this call, right? We see this call, and the call came from an unusual place. See, people think that God got to show up and speak ugly to them to have a call. People think that God got to show up in a dream and speak to them to have a call. This call was in accordance with God's word. Every real call of God, you can verify with his word. Amen. Amen. I'm going to say that again. Every real call of God is verifiable in the word of God. Amen. When Cyrus issued this decree, they didn't have to wonder if it was the devil. They didn't have to wonder if somebody was tricking them or if it was just some, some government propaganda. Because God had already said it in his word. Wow. They just didn't know how it was coming. Do you hear me? And so often God will tell you what, but not tell you how. Mm, 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 mm. Mm? That's good. He'll, he'll show you, he'll give you a vision of what's to come, but he won't tell you how you're going to get there. He'll, he'll make you walk with him to get there. Mm. Hallelujah. He'll show you a picture of the vacation spot, but then you got to get on the boat. You got to drive through the forest. You got to, you got to get to, you got to, and you got to be with him to get there. He has to personally escort you. Otherwise, you don't get to be there. You just get to know what it looked like. That's how he works. He don't give you all the instructions before you get there. <laughs> I wish somebody would have told me that a long time ago. I'll be way ahead of where I'm at now. I should have started the work I started long before I started. But I didn't know. All right. So that's how you legitimize the call. That's how you verify the call. That's how you authenticate the call. You know, there used to be, um, <laughs> there used to be, I, when I was young, I used to look like to get up on Saturday morning. And back then, there was something called regular TV. And on regular TV, the, the cartoons only came on on Saturday and after school in the evenings. And so Saturday morning, all these array of cartoons came on from about 8 to 12. And it was a high time for the kids, right? And so the kids get up, parents still in bed, they didn't have to go to work with us. Kids get up, and they don't know how to do nothing, so they fix themselves some cereal, Right? Don't know how to cook no food, so you fit some cereal. So you sit there with your big bowl of cereal, get you a great big old bowl of cereal. And you get in there, and you watch your TV, and you eat your cereal. It's a high time, praise God. Oh but all the time, the cereal box producers got smart. The advertisers got smart. And they would put stuff on the box. It wasn't just a cereal box no more. Now it has a puzzle. Now it's a game. Now it has, uh, has something on the inside. So some kids would, would dig down in there and then mama get on them by putting their hand in the box. Some kids would pour it all out to get to the prize. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Yes. And so my mama pointed at me because I did. <laughs> and so what you do is you, you, you get the prize and you, you want to eat more seriously her and get to the prize because mama don't want you to pour it all out. She don't want you to reach your hand in there. So you're just going to eat more cereal. You're like, I'm going to eat as much cereal as I can to her and get to the prize. I see some people smiling. Yeah. And so there was a time when they had something called a decoder in the box because they had secret messages, right? You would get one message on one box or, or you get a book in one box and then you get the secret decoder in another box or you have to mail off for the secret decoder. Is that right? Mm -hmm. 
And the secret decoder will tell you what the message said that you already had, but has not yet been verified. Mm. We have a secret decoder, y'all. Yes. When the Holy Ghost opened up the pages of the Bible to you, yes. you can discern truth from error. Yes. You can discern a legitimate call from just a nice thought in your mind. You can discern the will of God, his good, perfect, acceptable will from, from just things that you think you might want to do. Mm -hmm. That's how you determine between what's good and what's best. You got a secret to code. That's right. That's right. Hallelujah. The Holy Ghost illuminates this word. Now, you can't have one without the other. That's right. Because if you got the word without the Holy Ghost... It won't do you no good. It don't work. You got to have the whole. See, sometimes those secret decoders came in two pieces. You had the red and the green. You had to put them together. And you, then you could see the thing. Good God Almighty. Y'all know what I'm saying. And so, and so you had to put it together. You got to put the word with the spirit. Yes. You see, some, some, some of my brothers, they think that the word is enough. They want to deny the spirit and all the manifestations of the spirit. But the word by itself is not enough. Jesus said, I'm not going to leave you orphans. I'm going to send the Holy Ghost. He said, after that power has come upon you, when you get the right power, good God Almighty. But now some of my, my more charismatic brothers think that all you need is the Spirit, and they don't take the time to learn the Word. Mm, come on, come and so they want to move by the Spirit, but if you don't know the Word, there's no boundaries to the Spirit sometimes, and you might find yourself listening to the wrong Spirit because you ain't got the Word to keep you straight. And so you need both pieces to decode it accurately. Amen. Do you hear me? Amen. You need the word and the spirit. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. I got to move on. You see, I, I spent so much time on the call because for years I didn't understand what a call was, how, how God used the call, and, and, and what it meant. And why some people with calls don't respond. See, I was just this little poor boy from nowhere that nobody knew. And when God called me, I wasn't like other folk who ran. I was just trying to understand. Because I, I, was, I felt privileged and still do that I have the opportunity to represent God. Do you hear me? Yeah. It is an honor. Yeah. It is an awesome privilege. I am not worthy to stand before anybody and represent the God of heaven, but some kind of way he made me fit. Amen. Amen. He put the blood on me, put the spirit in me, and made me and qualified me to be able to do what I'm doing right now. And I've always seen it as a privilege. So whenever I come across somebody who don't see it as a privilege, I'm perplexed. Yes. Because I'm like, what could be greater? Yes. Is there anything greater? Yes. I don't care if you're a CEO. I represent God. Yes. I don't care if you're an ambassador. Yes. I represent God. Yes. 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 I don't care if you're the most successful salesman. Yes. Represent, don't compare to what I represent Amen. because I represent God. Yes. Yes. Woo! Yes. And so the fact that some people could not respond to the call is perplexing to those of us who do. Mm -hmm. Let's move on. Yes. Oh, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Whenever there's a call to rebuild something worthy, there's always a cost. In Ezra chapter 6, pardon me just a second, get a little warm in here. In Ezra chapter 6, I'm sorry, Ezra chapter 1 verse 6, after we see that some responded to the call, we see that, and all they that were about them strengthened their hands, now to strengthen them means they, they invested in them, they gave them something, that's what that means here. Because sometimes people want to pray for you but not, not do for you. That's right. Sometimes people want to <laughs> sometimes, sometimes they want to pray that you have some money but not give you no money. Amen. They want to pray that you get some help but not help you. Yes. That's right. They want to pray that you get some more members but not, but, but not even show up themselves nor influence the people that they know to come. Yes. They, they want to they act like they're strengthening you but they really ain't strengthening you. 
because you can't see their support. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They say they pray, but you can't even feel their prayers. Ooh, Jesus. Mm -hmm. I'm telling the truth. Yes. And all they that were about them stripped their hands with vessels of silver, with gold, with goods, with beasts, with precious things, besides all that was willingly offered. Because Cyrus had made some people give. It came out the treasury. But also some people gave willingly. Mm. They, weren't going, they weren't going there. But they was giving. See there's some missions that I believe in. That I give to. Even though I got my own ministry. And I'm not doing it over there. I'm not, I'm not fighting uh, uh, some of the causes that I believe in. Fighting for them. But I'm giving to them. So that somebody else is strengthened. Mm. To be able to accomplish that angle to take that ground over there. See, we all we all on the same team. Yes. See, and I'm taking this piece right here, but somebody else is taking that piece over there. And in the end, you see, that's what Ezra and Nehemiah did. They they understood. I want to do. Here's what I really want to do. But God led in another direction. I want to do a comparison of Nehemiah and Ezra and show you how God can use two completely different people because they are two completely different people. They do completely different things, but it all accomplish the same goal. It all establishes Jerusalem's worship again, free from fear, so that focus people can focus again on the Lord, mm. and God can come and be with His people. Mm. Ezra didn't. Ezra didn't build no walls. Mm. He didn't even build the altar, but he established the worship practice. Mm. Nehemiah didn't establish a worship practice, but he built the walls. So that when they did worship, they can do it without fear. Mm. That's right. Hallelujah. And it all accomplished God's goal of getting back to Eden. Mm. Mm. Do you understand? See, there's some church ministries, and then there's some, some things called parachurch ministries. And a parachurch is in a church, but it's a group of people from various churches who get together to do something that the church ain't doing in and of itself, or that they can do better than any one church can do. Mm -hmm. And so they, they get together and do that to help accomplish the overall goal of what all the other churches are trying to do too, but they're coming from another angle. Mm -hmm. You know, when you when you go to attack, I've been in the Navy, I've been in the Air Force, and I work with the Army. And it's interesting because nowadays when you go to attack, when we go into Iraq, or we go in somewhere else, the first one, of, it depends on the strategy, but sometimes we send in ground forces. And usually Marines are the first to go. But if the Marines run into some trouble, they call for something called air support. Mm -hmm. And usually there's a ship on the coast with an aircraft carrier or something with some planes. You see, you see how this thing works? It's all coming from different angles. Sometimes to soften the people up, to soften the enemy up, before we go there, we go and bomb them and then send the troops in. Then after we send the troops in, then we then we tell the UN y'all can come and establish some 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 regular similitude of government now. Mm -hmm. Once we done got rid of the enemy, mm -hmm. then we set up the government that we want. You see, and we make sure they're established before we leave. And it all takes different organizations to accomplish their overall goal, and they hit it at different angles, mm -hmm. but they're all doing their part. And that's the way God designed the church. Yes. That's the way God designed yes. your family. Yes. And every healthy organization understands this. Yes. That each one has their gift. Mm -hmm. Each one has their calling. Each one has their area of responsibility. Mm -hmm. But we're working together. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jesus. There's a cost involved. Upfront cost, shall I say. Because mm -hmm. I'm going to talk about two different types of costs. There's an upfront cost, and then there's an enduring cost. Do you hear me? When you buy a home, there's upfront costs. But then they have some costs that they call the back-end costs, right? The interest that you're paying on a regular basis is the back-end costs. You pay that for 30 years. But now, the origination fee that you pay is some upfront costs. Is that right? You all hear me? Yes. The down payment was the upfront cost. But the, the payments that you make over the span or over the term of the loan is the ongoing cost. It costs you one thing to buy the car, but then it's going to cost you some more to maintain the car. And so there's always upfront costs 
to the call of God on your life. And then there is enduring, continuing cost that I call commitment. Mm -hmm. We'll deal with costs up front first. Upfront cost is found in Ezra chapter 1, verses 6 through 11. You see that other people gave also the king brought forth the vessels of the house of the Lord. See, the enemy had taken from them the vessels of the house of the Lord, and now God is making the secular government restore it. Mm. Good God Almighty. Yeah. Jesus. I can, I can make some parallels to today, but I don't have time for that right now. Cyrus brought forth the treasure, the things of the house of the Lord. And even though, even those did Cyrus, king of Persia, bring forth by the hand of uh, Mithrathoth, the treasurer, and numbered them to Sheshbazar. And it goes on to say, and this is the number of them, and then it gives you the number. And then in 11 it says, and all the vessels of gold and silver were 5,400. All these did Sheshbazar, Sheshbazar. Uh, 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 bring up with them of the captivity that were brought up from Babylon into Jerusalem. And so they gave out of the treasury and they gave from the people. Right? There was some, but but what they understood was there's some upfront costs. When Nehemiah, and I don't have time to go there right now, when he accepted his call. Because now I'm gonna show you Ezra accepted his call, Nehemiah accepted his call. And briefly, I'll describe how they were different. Ezra Meyer was an introvert. I mean, Ezra was an introvert. Nehemiah was an extrovert. One way I know this is because when they were frustrated, Ezra pulled his own hair out, but Nehemiah pulled other folk hair out. That's right. And so <laughs> that tell you right there a whole lot right there. That, that right there tell you a whole lot. Thank you, Jesus. And so, but God used both these very different men to accomplish his will of Establishing Eden living in the earth. Do you hear me? Ezra chapter 3. Let's turn there quickly. Because I'm, I'm a little behind time. Ezra chapter 3 verses, uh, verses uh, 2 and 3. Then Joshua. Let's see. Yeshua. The son of Yazadak. And his brother the priest is Arubabel the son of Shiltiel, and his brethren, uh, um, they stood up and built the altar of God of Israel. Now, they ain't have no building yet. They ain't have no walls. They just built an altar because, you see, the, the Hebrews understood that all you need is an altar. I'm going to say that again. Yeah. All you really need in your life is an altar. You may not have a place to lay your head. You may not have a car to drive. You may not even have a job right now, but if you have an altar, everything's going to be all right. Yeah. All you really need yeah. is an altar. Once you got your altar, baby, you in business. Yeah. They ain't have no temple. They ain't have no walls. Foundation was They ain't have nothing, but they had an altar. Mm. I remember a time in my life I ain't have nothing but an altar. Mm. Good God Almighty. Mm. I ain't have nothing but a hope and a prayer. Thank you, Jesus. Mm. And I call on the name of the Lord. And he answered me. Yes. Bible says, this poor man cried. Yes. And the Lord heard him. Yes. Good God Almighty. Amen. Amen. But they stood up and they built the altar of the God of Israel to burn incense thereon, as it is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. And they set the altar upon his basis. Listen to this. For fear mm. was upon them mm -hmm. because of the people of those countries. And even though they were scared, they did it anyway. Amen. Amen. They offered burnt offerings there unto the Lord, even burnt offerings morning and evening. That's the continual burnt offer that God talks about. You're supposed to offer an offer in the morning, and you're supposed to offer an offering in the evening. Hallelujah. And if you organize your life right, you'll have an altar in your heart, and you'll pray to God in the morning, and you'll seek him in the evening. And you'll do it continually. And that's what they did even though they were scared. Mm. They didn't have everything they needed. There was opposition to their call. But they did it anyway because that's what God said to do. They understood this is the most important thing. Before they had a sewer system, they had an altar. Mm. Before they, look, look, listen, listen. Boys, before you get a wife, you better get an altar. Ladies, before you get a husband, you better get an altar. Yes. Huh? Yes. 
Before you try to accept that next job, you better have you an altar that you go pray on to ask God if this is his will. Yes. You see, before they did anything, they had an altar. You ever notice the first thing Noah did when he came off the ark? Mm -hmm. The brother built an altar. Yes, it did. Have you built an altar in your life? Do you have a place where you go and meet God in the depths of your heart where you expose yourself naked before him? Where you really encounter and experience. I ain't talking about where you play church. I ain't talking about where you might sing a song or two or where you might attend a prayer meeting because somebody made you. I'm talking about where you open up to God while you lay on your bed and ain't nobody around and tears roll down the side of your face but you are naked before God. Baby, you got an altar. Mm -hmm. Do you hear me? That's what I'm talking about. Before you get anything else, you get you an altar. Before you build anything else in life, make sure you build an altar. Before you build a reputation, before you build some credentials, you build an altar. But that was a, there was a cost involved. Not only did they pay, did the people send them with gold and with silver and things of that nature, but they, they, it says that, that they... Despite, I'm reading from the NIV now, it says, despite their fear of the peoples around them, they built the altar on its foundation and sacrificed burnt offerings on it to the Lord, both the morning and evening sacrifices. What was the cost? The cost was these people might kill us. They don't like what we're doing. Who knows what the response is going to be? I don't know, and I don't care. Let the chips fall where they may. I'm going to serve God. Amen. That was their conclusion. You see, when you make up your mind like that, you're paying a cost because somebody ain't going to like it. Mm -hmm. Somebody ain't going to like that you're praying the way you're praying. Mm -hmm. Somebody ain't going to like the way that, that, that you're praying as often as you're praying. Some people ain't going to like that you're trying to live for God and you ain't running with them. Some people ain't going to like that they can't get ahead of you no more because now God has given you some discernment and some wisdom. Some people ain't going ain't gonna to like that they can't manipulate you no more because now you got the Holy Ghost to lead you into all truth. Some people ain't going to like it. That's right. That's right. Some people ain't going to like it. And that's a cost you just got to pay. That's an upfront cost. You got to do what you're going to do for the Lord regardless of who likes it. Amen. Amen. Don't matter who don't like it. You got to do it. If you want to follow God. Because his mission calls you to it. And that's the cost required. You ever notice that even when you go places, you got to pay admission costs. There's a cost to get in. You don't even know if the movie gonna be good, but you gotta pay ahead of time to see it. Right, <laughs> right. Am I right? True. You gotta pay ahead of time. There's stores around here I don't even like to go to, I ain't gonna name them. Mm -hmm. But you gotta pay to get in to shop at their store. I don't like that. Mm -hmm. You're already making money off of me through your profit margin. You're gonna make more money off of membership? You gotta be crazy. All right, let's go on. <laughs> After a call, and after you pay the upfront cost, you got to understand that there's a commitment. Anything worth rebuilding requires a commitment. You see, I, I see it happen with the saints all the time. They get touched by the Holy Ghost. They get, they get filled. They get happy. They get touched by God. They inspired from Sunday's message, and they treat people nice all day Monday. But come Tuesday, mm -mm. some kind of way they done woke up, woke up on the wrong side. They don't want to be bothered. They ain't had their coffee. Something, something, something just ain't right. They, and, 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 they, and you can tell because cause, cause it happened every time they get touched by God. And they strain it. They're working so hard, bless their hearts, to try to be nice. They try so hard, but it don't even sound like them. And they, they, cause they try so hard because it ain't natural. That's right. It ain't natural. They don't naturally be nice to people, so they don't know how to act. But they try. Praise God. They try. They, but they're straining at it and it feels all convoluted and everything because they, they, they're willing to pay the cost, but the commitment is straining on them. It's, it's just a little too heavy for them. And, and, and unfortunately, sometimes by Wednesday, they done gave up because they understood costs. They heard the call, but they didn't understand commitment. See, commitment is that ongoing cost. <laughs> commitment is that ongoing cost that you don't pay up front, but you got to pay a, a couple days into it. 
A couple months later, here come another fee. And if you ain't careful, you'll be discouraged. Dang, I just paid for this, and now I gotta pay for that. And here come another one, and when does it stop? But if you understand commitment, you go ahead and make provision for the upcoming costs, because you know they're coming, but what you want is worth it. Wow. Do you hear me? So as you go on the lawn, you set something to the side. Mm. You're already planning to make that payment because what you want is worth it. And when you are committed, you have made up in your mind that what you want is worth whatever cost you have to oh. pay. Amen. That's the definition of commitment. If you're not willing to pay ongoing costs, mm. you are simply not committed. Mm. When we decide to have children, our first one was a girl. Girls come with all kinds of costs. They do. I think girls cost more than boys because they got they have special shoes for this and special outfit for that, and that don't go with this, and this don't go with that, and then they need a skirt for this, and a dress for that, and pants for this, and, and guys, and they need all different color shoes to match. All a guy need is a couple pair of slacks, some jeans, and maybe a couple of sweats or some shorts, and you good. Brown shoes, black shoes, you good. You can match up everything. But girls... You need everything. Then you got to have the earrings to match this and then the thing to match the purse and that purse don't match this outfit. Woo! <laughs> but I didn't try to stick it back in there and return the sin. <laughs> I said praise God <laughs> and kept paying the cost because I, I, I considered her worth it. Amen. Right? Amen. <laughs> Because I consider that my children are worth it, so I don't complain about the cost. Mm. When you consider it worthy, you don't complain about the cost. Mm. There you go. When you consider something worthy, mm. you don't complain. That's why I get nervous when Christians start talking about how hard it is to live for Jesus. Because I consider Jesus too worthy to complain about any other cost. What my Savior did for me on Calvary. Hallelujah. Was worth so much that I can never complain about anything I got. Amen. Amen. You can't beat God's giving. No matter how hard you try. Praise God. Mm. Hallelujah. And so now we need to look at commitment. Because without commitment, your upfront costs will have been a waste. Everything you put up front without the continuing commitment, it won't, it won't live long enough to come to pass. There's people who fall out of ministry. Did you hear me? There's folks who give up on their marriages. Do you hear me? There's people who quit school. There's people who, 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 who can't make it through the next evolution on the job. Not because they're unable, but because they decide that it's not worth it. Did you know that most of education isn't really that hard? To get a degree ain't that hard. It don't require a lot of intelligence. It requires a lot of commitment mm -hmm. and persistence. Mm -hmm. Huh? Mm -hmm. It requires persistence. And if you go on the higher learning, you'll realize that there's people there who want straight A's. Mm -hmm. There are people with PhDs, doctorate degrees, That's true. who are C and B students, right. but because they persisted, is that right? Mm -hmm. That's true. Because they persisted. Because they kept paying mm -hmm. on it. Mm -hmm. You know, you can have certain insurance policies, but if you stop paying on it, but if you keep paying, mm -hmm. is that right? Mm -hmm. Then it will do what you want it to do. Mm -hmm. But the day you stop paying, you got a problem. It ain't going to do what, it's gonna, what you want it to do no more. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Some things you have to feed. Mm. If you got a dream, you got to feed your dream. Mm -hmm. If you don't feed your dream, your dream will die. Mm -hmm. If you have faith for something, you got to feed your faith. If you don't feed your faith, you'll fall into fear and you'll give up on it. Commitment. Ezra 7. Turn with me there. This is one of my favorite scriptures in the whole Bible. Mm. And it reads... Verse 10, for Ezra understood commitment. That isn't what it says, but that's what it says. 
For Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord, but he didn't stop there. And to do it, but he didn't stop there. And to teach in Israel statutes and judgments. You see what Ezra did? Ezra said, Lord, I'm committed to your cause because it blesses me. So Ezra said, I'm going to learn it for myself first. I'm going to be blessed first. I'm going to be the first partaker of the fruit. I'm going to get close to Jesus for my own self. You see, if you ain't careful in ministry, sometimes you'll be doing so much to others until you neglect your own relationship. And so Ezra said, first and foremost, I'm going to get right with God. Then he said, I'm going to do what I learned to do. You see, it's one thing to know it, it's another to do it. Yes. You see, you see, you can listen to a man preach and sometimes he's telling you what he knows, but it's a whole other experience when he doesn't tell, tell you what he did. Yes. When, when you preach out of experience, out of what the Holy Ghost done did in your life, there is nothing that somebody who just read it in a book can tell you. Yes. Do you hear what I'm saying? Woo, good God Almighty. And so he didn't just read the book. He started to put what he learned into practice. Mm. He, he, he tried the Lord to see if these things were true. Mm. You see, some things you won't know until you try it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Some things you will not know until you try what God said and see that his word is true. Wow. That's why he said, try me in this and see mm. if I will open up the windows of heaven and pour you out of this. Amen. And if you never try it, you'll never see. Amen. Ezra then decided that he was going to express and expand God's territory by teaching others. Mm. He was not only going to experience Eden for himself. He was going to make sure that some other folk experience Eden living. He was co-laboring with God. But you see, that requires something. That requires some discipline. You discipline yourself as a disciple to accomplish your master's will. Do you hear me? He didn't get educated without reading. Some people want to come to church and not read their Bibles. That's what Vision 2020 was all about. To put a pause to that and say, before you let me teach you what the Bible say, how about you read the Bible yourself? Mm -hmm. How about we go along five chapters a day, every, every week, reviewing what you read and then Sunday preaching it. Mm -hmm. And if you have any questions, come back and let's talk about it the next week. Mm -hmm. That requires some discipline. That's right. Is that right? That's that requires some commitment. Those two days that you can catch up, you can play around, or if you fell behind, you can catch up. Amen. Some people fall behind and never catch up. Amen. And their testimony will be that they never read the Word of God. When I say, okay, who read the Word of God? Who read the whole Bible? They won't be able to raise their hands. Mm -hmm. They couldn't do it last year, and they won't be able to do it next year. Mm -hmm. Because they didn't discipline. That's part of commitment. Yes. When you are committed, you discipline yourself. Yes. You do things you don't want to do. When you don't want to do them. Amen. You do things that you think are dumb, but it's required, so you do it anyway. You do things that 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 you know, you've done a million times and you may not even see the purpose in doing it anymore. But you do it one more time. Mm. Yes, just mm. one more. <laughs> because that's what's required to get there. That's what's required to accomplish this. And it may be a small piece, but it's a necessary piece, so I'm going to do it anyway. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. I may not always feel like preaching the word of God. I may not always have something to say, but I'm going to get up and surrender to God and do it anyway. That's right. Yes. That's right. Yes. Huh? It amazes me how some people can go to class every day, but complain about coming to church on Sunday and Wednesday. Mm -hmm. 
and then fall behind and never try to catch up. Mm. They'll catch up in class. Do you have notes I can borrow? Mm -hmm. They'll catch up on the reading to make sure they pass the test, but the ultimate test they never try to catch up on. God is giving you an open book test. Amen. Mm. And some of us are failing. Mm. An open book test. Mm. You have all your life to find the answers. Mm. And the test is open book. Yeah. And you're going to mess around and fail at that. Mm. The reason why you accept the call. The reason why you pay the cost and the reason why you continue to be committed is because of the commendation you expect to receive. Do you hear me? Turn with me to Nehemiah 13. At the very end of Nehemiah, he gonna get at the heart of why he did what he did. The very end of Nehemiah, the very last verse, I took you to the last verse in Chronicles, right? Now I'm taking you to the last verse in Nehemiah. Very interesting. What famous last words. Verse 30 and 31 says, Thus cleansed I them from all strangers and appointed the wars of the priests and the Levites. Whenever you read the Bible, pay close attention to the verbs because the verbs tell you what folk did, okay. not just what they said. And everyone in his business, he's given a summary of what he accomplished. And for the wood offering at times appointed, and for the first fruits, then he concludes with one last prayer. Remember me, oh my God, for good. That man who was hanging on the cross beside Jesus had one concern. Yes, sir. Remember me. Nehemiah, what he did, 13 chapters of work when he left Persia and the comforts thereof, when he had to deal with all the problems that he dealt with throughout the book, all the adversaries, not even a plot on his life. In the end, all he wanted was for God to remember Amen. him. If you remember me and what I did for you, Lord, that's all I need. I just need you to see. That's what Nehemiah is saying. But don't worry, Nehemiah. I want you to know that God keeps good books. In our English Bible, it's the last book of the Bible. It says, Then they that feared the Lord spake often to one another. Are y'all speaking often to one another? Mm. Then they that feared the Lord spake often to one another, and the Lord hearkened and heard it. Now, check this out. This is my favorite part. And a book of remembrance Come on. was written before him. I'm sorry, it was written before him for them that feared the Lord. Who was the book for? It wasn't for him. It said it was written before him for them that feared him. So there's a, there's a record being kept for your sake. Good God Almighty. When you serve the Lord out of a pure heart, he's keeping good accounts on your behalf. Good God Almighty. Hallelujah. God is keeping good books. And it goes on to say, and that thought upon his name. Don't worry that you can't get out and evangelize like you want to. Because if you're thinking about the Lord, he's keeping that down to you. He write that Amen. down to you. And those yeah. that thought about him, good yeah. God. Yeah. And your yeah. thoughts are toward God. You keep a record of that too. Yeah. He knows what you think. Good God Almighty. You can't do like you want to do. But if you think Woo! right, he's keeping a record of that. Yes. Woo! Thank you, Lord. Well, Almighty God, we serve. Revelation says, and I saw the dead, great and small, small and great, stand before God, Revelation 20, 12. And the books were opened. And another book were opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. I wonder what would be read when God opened your book. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. Proverbs 12 and 8 says, a man shall be commended according to his wisdom, but he that is of a perverse heart shall be despised. You see, God's going to get at your intentions for doing what you do. When he judge you before he commend you for doing it, see, there's people who achieve a lot in life, but it's all going to be for nothing when God reviews it. When God comes and audit, there's intentions. I said God will audit your intentions. 
When God comes to audit their intentions, he will realize they had a perverse heart and they will not be commended. Corinthians 10 and 18 says, for not he that commended himself is approved. See, there's some people say, well, I don't care what the Bible thinks. This is what I'm going to do. And I'm proud of myself for having done what I want to do. And so they will not be commended. He is not therefore commended who commends himself, but whom the Lord commends. Jesus. You see, in the end, it don't matter what nobody say but God. Don't matter if anybody gave you a boy a pat on the back or your, your boy over there said, yeah, man, that's right. Oh, any of that. Or oh, the girls over there said, mm, girl, I wish I had this. And so none of that matters. None of that matters. Only the commendation that comes from the Lord. Hallelujah. First Corinthians 15 and 58 says, therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast. Be unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Why? For as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Keep on going. Keep on pushing. Keep on striving. Keep on building. Go back and rebuild. Go back and get those things right that, that you used to have right that you ain't got right no more. But God's giving you this chance to rebuild something worthy. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Seven times in the book of Revelation. God says that he will reward those who do his will. See, when God recruit and enlist you, the benefits package is out of this world. <laughs> Revelation 2, 7 says, He that have an ear, let him hear what the Spirit said to the churches. To him that overcometh. Overcome what? His desire to quit. His desire to turn back, to take his hand off the plow, to not fulfill on his commitment, to not receive the call of God on his life that I'm calling him to, not to respond to me. To him who overcome all that, I will give to either the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. What is he doing? I'm going to take it back to Eden living. Mm -hmm. Revelation 2.11. He that have an ear, let him hear what the Spirit said unto the church. He that overcome shall not be hurt in the second death. Revelation 2.17 He that have an ear, let him hear what the Spirit said unto the churches. To him that overcometh, I will give to eat of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name, which no man knoweth, saying, He that received it. Revelation 2.26 To he that overcometh. You see what God, God wants you to be a what? Overcomer. He says as much. He says you are overcomers. And he said, but just because he says you are don't mean you are because you may not receive the call. <laughs> just because God says you something don't mean that you're going to be what he said you're going to be because you got to decide to respond appropriately. Mm. And if you don't respond appropriately, you will never be what he said you are. Mm. Because that's how God word work in our mm. life. He says the word, but we got to receive it mm. and respond appropriately. Mm. It don't matter what nobody prophesied over to you. Mm -hmm. It matters how you respond. Mm -hmm. It don't matter what God said about Saul. It doesn't matter what God said about Jeroboam. It matters how they responded. Amen. God wanted to bless them, man. He wanted to bless Saul. He said the same thing to Saul that he said to David. He said the same thing to Jeroboam that he said to David. He said, if you follow like David followed me, I'll bless you like I promised to bless David. Mm -hmm. Go back and look at it. Y'all read that, right? Mm -hmm. He ain't no respect of persons. He respect response. Mm. He don't respect persons. He respect response. Mm. That's why somebody who you ain't never heard of, God can raise up, depending on how they respond. And somebody who God really want to use or who has a big name may not be, God may not do with them what he's doing with somebody who you never even heard of because of response to God's call. Mm. Good God. Where did I leave off? Revelation 2.26. He that overcometh and keepeth my works, keepeth my works who are who serving me unto the end. He has some commitment. To him I will give power over the nations. Why? Because I can trust him. He's going to do right. When God comes back and establishes his kingdom, some of us are going to be put in position to rule. Do you hear me? Some higher than others. Based on how you responded to the call. Revelation 2, 
Revelation 3, 5, he that overcome with the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. See, your name got to be blotted out of the book of life. God wants everybody to live. But now those who don't receive the blood of Jesus, whose sins aren't blotted out, their name get blotted out. That's what the Bible said. You can have whatever kind of theories you want. That's what the Bible said. Revelation 3.12. Him that overcometh, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. See, I try to encourage folks and tell folks, you want positions in the church because that qualifies you for positions in eternity. Mm -hmm. You want to be a pillar in the church because that qualifies you to be a pillar in the temple of God. And he shall go out no more. See, folks so concerned about their little lie to folks don't serve in the church like they used to. Mm -hmm. When me and my wife were coming up, we served, we learned how to serve in the church, mm -hmm. how to support a church. When my parents were in every church, they support the church. But now folks act like they they got everything else to do but support the church. But when it's all said and done, what they are building ain't worthy to stand in the judgment. It's going to get burnt up. Mm. And only what they did for Jesus will last. Amen. Amen. And see, when you understand that, then that, that, that's, when you start, that's when you start sacrificing. That's when you start giving. That's when you start rearranging your priorities when you understand eternity. And he shall go out no more, and I will write upon his name the name of my God. I'm sorry, write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. Y'all know that heaven is going to be on earth. There's going to be a new heaven, a new earth, and a new Jerusalem, and God, because heaven is wherever God is, and Jesus is going to be in right. New Jerusalem. And the whole earth is going to be redeemed. It's going to be brand new, y'all. But it's going to look a whole lot like it used to in Genesis 1 and 2. Mm -hmm. Because that's what God is doing. And he calls you to join him in accomplishing that. Revelation 3.21, to him that overcome power, grant to sit with me in my throne. That's speaking of authority again. And what God and position is of authority. Even as I also overcame and I sat down with my father in his throne. And so in conclusion, where are you getting that preaching? What I'm saying is when you get back to your life, mm -hmm. is what you're getting back to worth rebuilding? That's right. Is what you're in a hurry to get out of church, to get out to, worth rebuilding? Mm -hmm. Is it is what you in a hurry to start watching some good preaching on the internet and get right back to your soaps or to your stories or to your show or to whatever else, whatever other frivolous things that the enemy has thrown a curveball to get you distracted with? Is it really worth rebuilding? The Bible says for well, in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 3, 11 through 15, for other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. That's the only rock that you can stand on. If your life is based on anything other than Jesus Christ, Christ. you are standing on sinking sand. Amen. Now, if any man build upon this foundation, now this is talking to Christians who, whose life is supposed to be based on Jesus, but now how you going to be? What kind of material are you going to use? What's your focus? How much are you going to pay for what you're building now that you're saved? If any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest. God going to test what you done built with your life. Amen. For the day, what day? The day of the Lord. What's the day of the Lord? When God come back to judge all things. They talk about it in the Old Testament. They talk about it in the New Testament. It's called the day of the Lord. There's going to come a day. I don't know if it's a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Friday, Saturday, or Sunday. There's coming a day when the Lord is going to crack open the sky. And everything wrong is going to be made right. And, and he's going to judge everybody based on what they did. Yes. Amen. And every, it, says, it, says, it says, every man's word shall be made manifest. Ain't no secrets on that day, y'all. Mm, 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 mm. 
For the day shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire. Amen. And the fire is going to try every man's work of what sort it was. God's going to know what kind of work that was. It might look great to us now, but God shrivel that thing down and burn it up and then they ain't, it's just ashes. But some people work don't look like much now. But when you when you when you put the fire to it and you burn the dross off and you start to see what it really is, that thing gonna be pure gold. Mm. Pure gold. There's some people we think are successful when God gets through trying them, they ain't gonna have no nothing but ashes left. Mm. And there's some people that we don't think nothing of. Right. I, I, I got some struggling preachers in my mind right now. Hallelujah. I got some small ministries in my mind right now. And that don't mean that the big ministries ain't going to get rewarded. They'll get rewarded appropriately. But what I'm saying is that there's some people that don't nobody respect, don't nobody think nothing of, that when God come and judge their work, you're going to be astounded at how much it's worth. Yes, yes. The Bible says that the fire shall try every man's work to tell what sort of work it was. Amen. And the Bible goes on to say, if any man's work abide, which he have built their own, then he shall receive a reward. But if any man's work shall be burned, if anything you're doing is frivolous, if anything you're doing ain't worthwhile, if anything you're doing ain't worthy to stand before the scrutiny of the fiery eyes of Jesus, It shall be burned, and he shall suffer loss. Now, he's talking to Christians, so he goes on to say, but he himself shall be saved. So he ain't talking to unbelievers right here, y'all. He's talking to y'all. Yes. You might be saved, but will your work be saved? That's right. You might be saved, but have you spent your time on frivolous things or on something that's going to last? He shall be saved. He himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. It's like God took you out of a fiery building because that whole building that you done built is coming down in ashes and he yanked you out like he did Lot. Mm. And on that day, some people's lives are going to be summed up with that right there. He's going to snatch you out as through fire. Mm. Whole life wasted. God saved you, put a call on your life, and you did nothing. Mm. Nothing. Jesus. And God going to come back and say, I'm going to save you because you're mine, but shame on you. Mm. All that time, all that you built, all of it, everybody going to see coming down in ashes. Mm. All of it. All of it. Coming down in ashes. Why? Because you wasn't really for the Lord. Matthew 12, 30 says, He that is not with me is against me. And he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. See, if you ain't gathering in God's people, if you ain't gathering in stuff for God, if you ain't gathering in uh, sticks and, and stones and bricks for the building of what God is trying to build, you working against him. you scattering people abroad. Because other people are looking at you and saying, Oh, well, they're doing it, so I might as well too. Well, they're supposed to be Christian. Well, they're a preacher's kid, and that's how they do. So I might as well do it too, because what you do affect other people. Because they're looking at you and going to make a draw some conclusion. So you are scattering people away from the Lord. Amen. Amen. You're scattering people away from the Lord because you ain't gathering them together. Hallelujah. This is God's invitation, and I'm concluding. To build a life worth living. And it all begins with yes. Yes to God's call. Yes to the cost. Yes to the commitment. And keeping your eyes focused on the author and the finisher of your faith that you are saying yes to your commendation. So that one day, when he comes back, Hallelujah. you might wear a crown. Amen. So when Jesus returns, you might receive well done. My good and faithful servant. Are you working on what God's working on? Or are you working your own agenda? Are you doing the things God wants you to do? Or are you doing the frivolous things that the devil has distracted you with? If you're working on God's agenda, he'll direct you. If you're not, he won't. 
If you're working on God's agenda, he'll support you. Yes, if you're not, he won't. If you're working on God's agenda, he will reward you. He will pay what is right. Yes, and if you are not working on his agenda, you can expect nothing from the Lord. I beseech you today to walk circumspect, to examine yourself and make sure you're in the faith. Make sure that you didn't just accept Jesus and then go off building something else. Amen. But that your life is a life that's responsive to God's call. Your life is a life that's willing to pay the cost for Jesus. Amen. Your life is a life that isn't just here today and gone tomorrow, but it's a life of continual commitment because all you want to hear from God when he remembers you is well done. Amen. Come and enjoy the presence of your Lord. With every head bowed and every eye closed. Right now, right where you are. Right where you are. Right where you are. I want you to consider yourself. The Bible says consider yourself. Hallelujah. Examine yourself. You're not the only one. I have to examine myself and get myself back on track. I have to beat my flesh into subjection. I have to shake myself and say, get back in line. You're not the only one. But for you and your life, you're all that matters right now. I want you to consider yourself. I want you to evaluate yourself. I want you to say, am I in the faith? Is what I'm building worth rebuilding? Is what I'm anxious to get back to worth getting back to at all? Or should I re rededicate, reprioritize, restructure my life? Maybe you're here and You've done all things well. And you don't need this message. But if you're here and you've gotten off in an area, you've gotten distracted, you've been, you've been, you've been, you've lost your focus, you've been deterred from God's destiny for your life. I want you to take this time in yourself. And you ain't got to shed no tear, you ain't got to feel real bad. All you got to do is make up your mind to respond to God's call, to, to take this invitation to heart and say, yes, Lord. 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 Yes, Lord.